colleagues um, working with our cities also on the gray part, which are uh, the operational emissions <laughs> uh, aspect of the building. So, I want to find. So uh, some of updates uh, of what we've been up to um, since the last call that we, we had. The big announcement is that we launched in November the Clean Construction Declaration, which uh, I invite you all to have a look at if you're curious. Um, the links are there on the, on the slides, but I'm also happy to share them on the chat box if easier. Um, we, this declaration has been signed initially by four cities, Budapest, Los Angeles, Mexico City, and Oslo. Um, and more cities are working on um, signing up the commitment. What is a bit different from this commitment compared to, me, to other commitments within C40 is that it sets the direction of travel, but it's a collective target. It shapes up the tangible actions that city needs to take to meet their share of responsibilities to meet this target, but it's really open for the private sector to come up with their action to meet their share of responsibility, um, which is something that really showcases how important the collaboration on this topic is, how important the collaboration is. Next steps are going to have more signatory cities in 2021, especially um, as part of a COP26 um, campaign, uh, so making sure that we have commitment from the industry and from cities in an aligned um, narrative and aligned way. And why is it urgent to do is because we all know that governments are calling to build their way uh, to recover the economy um, and that will have a big uh, embodied carbon impact. So we need to act now to showcase how clean construction is part of the green and just recovery. But yet the case is still to be made on how it helps job creation or equity if we're looking at the main interest in the US and North America. These are just the collective targets, um, which is basically to reduce embodied emission by at least 50% on uh, building and infrastructure by 2030 and to transition towards um, zero emission machinery. And it has a set of action and commitment from the city that basically follow what we call the construction hierarchy which is to um, build less, um, build smarter, use our procurement power, and be sure that um, you know, we, we reach uh, a circular landscape on construction. Some things I shared last time, I think, so I don't want to repeat myself too much, but the, the main aim of this declaration is to shift the market by aggregating city demand and showing the demand side is willing to, to move towards um, low carbon solution or zero carbon solution. Really a big shift on prioritizing um, the existing stock and making sure that we avoid carbon on top of tackling carbon reduction and requiring transparency and accountability for the sector on top of really keeping at heart core principle and values which are social justice, um, equity, green jobs and green transition and just transition. And that's also a way to showcase city leadership in this field and showcasing the action and really unlocking the benefits um, in terms of stimulating a green economy, ensuring that it's fair and equitable and enhancing resilience and really fostering sustainable lifestyles. Some other announcement uh, that we wanted to share are really that we have um, a number of knowledge resources available on, on C40's Knowledge Hub, which is open to everyone. Um, most of, the, of, of these resources are public facing. Some of them, you need to have an account um, to, to see them. Creating a, an account is free. Um, so there is no fee associated with that. Um, the first thing is a Clean Construction Policy Explorer uh, that we launched in partnership with CNCA, uh, CNCA, uh, sorry, CNCA and today is on the call, um, and that also uh, refer to the same categories of the framework that uh, CNCA developed then. This construction map is really a complementary resources in the sense that it showcases all of the type of actions that cities across the world are taking 
to really tackle um, the construction impacts in terms of policy, in terms of target and strategies, and in terms of pilots. It's now available in five languages. So it's available in um, English, French, Spanish, Portuguese, and Chinese. And it's really a work in progress. My colleague Tessa on the call there is uh, hard working to update it very regularly across the year and to translate these updates. But I'm also calling on all of you, if you know any city action that is missing in the map, please do let us know so we can uh, add it and have the most comprehensive resources um, possible. Then uh, keep an eye out uh, because in February, so this month, we're going to publish the first of a series of six deep dive uh, making the case report and infographics on what does clean construction look like in specific cities. Um, so we will have six cities, one per global region. The first one is going to be on North America and it's going to be the case of Toronto. So keep an eye out. I'll be sure to share the link uh, with you, Andrew, so that you can disseminate. Okay. <laughs> and we, we're also producing um, a series of education and informing resources in two different formats. On the Knowledge Hub, um, it's the suite of articles that I've shared the links to uh, in green. So there is a why piece on really explaining why we need to tackle um, embodied emissions and construction, and a how to piece, which is focusing at the moment on deconstruction, how you should prioritize deconstruction over demolition. And there is also a report um, giving really uh, a world life approach on how Nordic cities um, are approaching um, the build, building for tomorrow. But on top of that, we're also doing a series of um, webinars and training resources and on baselining. And this started in January with uh, Stacy uh, showcasing um, what she's doing also on, on EC3. Um, and baselining work, but also what has been the process for Oslo to set their baselining targets, and we're going to continue this work across the year. The last things that I wanted to share, it's my last slide, um, is that the, the forum is growing. We, we see a number of cities really showcasing interest and really um, seeing the benefit of being in the forum and being educated. And the awareness that we raised, thanks to the declaration work, has really led up to a more intense uh, participation from cities across the world on, in the forum, which is great to see. So we have more than 30 cities as part of the forum, a big presence from European and North American cities, but we see Latin America cities interest really growing, which is great. And the last piece of news is that we opened a new C40 office in Oslo um, with specific resources and person dedicated to clean construction, which is going to be even more useful to work on this topic. If you have any question, please don't hesitate to share with me. Great, thank you so much, Cecile. And, um... We've now got, uh, we have actually several organizations that are new to this group or first, uh, the first time that your organization has been re represented on the call. Um, and the first of those, I think is, uh, let's have Marta uh, Shans from ULI uh, tell us a little bit um, to make sure we know what is ULI and then uh, what is ULI doing around embodied carbon these days. And also I, I'd love to, uh, I want to make a, an announcement that Marta is a brand new member of the Carbon Leadership Forum Board. So thank you very much for uh, for joining this community, Marta. Go ahead. Yeah, happy to happy to be here. Uh, it definitely makes sense for for ULI to be a part of this NGO roundtable. I see some familiar faces, which is nice, and and I'm also uh, proud to to be one of CLF's newest board members. So it's it's all good things today. For a little background, ULI or the Urban Land Institute is a real estate industry group, it's global. We have over 45,000 individual members, the bulk of which are in the Americas, but we have a growing presence in Europe and Asia Pacific as well. We have the mission of creating and sustaining thriving communities. And one of the, the unique things about ULI is that we don't lobby, unlike a lot of other 
industry groups. Instead, we focus on thought leadership, knowledge sharing, content creation, and networking. And so we have a pretty sizable research team and I lead our green buildings research arm. We look at the business case for green buildings. Every way that you can reduce carbon emissions, we wanna tie that to increase building value. So very much kind of the economics business case side of things. And we have been increasing our work on embodied carbon over the past few years. We, we want our members to be aware of the well, number one, the fact that embodied carbon exists, <laughs> uh, as well as why it's important to reduce it, how to reduce it, and what the business case is. So back in November 2019, we published a report on just that, um, featuring some case studies, some tools, some resources, as well as kind of the six key reasons why real estate should care. Uh, first and foremost, that regulations are coming. I think Cecile talked to that quite nicely. Um, another reason is that green building certifications reward it. If you do it right, there's no cost premium, which um, which EC3 tool and others can, can show. Uh, there's also indirect construction benefits, like the speed of construction with mass timber and the like. Um, it helps garnering community goodwill. So when a developer or real estate owner is looking to uh, bid on a plot of land to develop on, being able to say that they're talking about embodied carbon and serious on that point is a, a real driver with the community. And then also, um, and I, I can't remember who mentioned some uh, some tech folks, but the tech tenants are, are driving a lot of demand on that. And we expect some fast followers from the, the non-tech tenants as well. So with that, we, we published this report and then we started having local chapters show interest, which has been uh, quite nice. Uh, we've done local events on embodied carbon with ULI San Francisco, ULI Toronto. We're doing um, a two-part event on embodied carbon next month with Vancouver because of their new embodied carbon policy. We're speaking with ULI's Colorado Sustainability Committee on this as well, just more to come. So it's really nice to see that local interest on embodied carbon. We're also partnering with other groups to spread the word. So whether it's with um, the uh, ILFI at their conferences or Net Zero Forum, like we're, we're just trying to spread word about why real estate and embodied carbon do in fact go together. From, from there, we, um, we put out a Net Zero goal for for our, our green print kind of community of practice within ULI. Um, unfortunately, it does not include embodied carbon yet in the definition of, of net zero. It's just looking at operations, but we didn't leave embodied carbon out of the discussion. We made sure that it stayed part of the, the overall dialogue. And we hope that over time we can add embodied carbon to that goal to get folks paying attention, benchmarking, measuring, reducing. And uh, we're also bringing embodied carbon to the, the main stage, if you will, for our, our upcoming virtual conference in May, we've got an entire session all about embodied carbon. And so we're bringing in some real estate developers to talk about what they're doing currently, right? A lot of folks think that embodied carbon is just way down the line, but it's happening now. And so we're excited that um, our panel of average Joe real estate members selected this topic as something that they wanted to be covered in the conference. Um, Two other things that, that we've been doing lately, just to, to round it out, is that um, one of our, our members in Tishman Spire, China, they're a, a global real estate firm. They, um, they decided that the time is now. And so they wanted to put together kind of owner-led common ask for ESG data of building materials. And so ULI is supporting those efforts with Mindful Materials and Architecture 2030 to put out this just common ask for ESG data and, in building materials, uh, starting in Asia, and then I think it'll grow globally. But seeing that, um, I don't know if you'd call it boots on the ground, but kind of bottoms up push for, for that data from suppliers and manufacturers was also quite um, thrilling, to be honest. And then last thing, in terms of what's next, um, beyond all of these kind of ongoing pieces, we are also quite interested in building fit outs. So refurbishments and, and interiors. And we're looking for, for a partner, kind of a, a funding partner to do a report on embodied carbon of interiors. And um, so many folks just talk about structural components, which are key, very important. But interiors are also something that we want to get ahead of. And so we are um, in early planning stages for putting together a, a real estate kind of audience focus about embodied carbon of interiors. So a lot going on at ULI with Embodied Carbon. Happy to be here and also excited about all of the other updates that have been shared. Andrew, anything else that you wanted me to share about ULI? That sounds perfect. Okay. Uh, and I'm, I'm really so grateful that you're, you're part of the call.
um, it was, it's great to hear that part of the world. Um, we can't make, make the kinds of changes, deep structural changes in the industry that we're looking for without demand from folks who are our customers. So, uh, so that's incredibly important. Um, another another organization that newly represented here is the uh, Climate Positive Design. Pamela, uh, would you take a few minutes and tell us, first of all, about your organization, about your mission, and then uh, and then what you're up to these days? Sure thing. Can I also share my screen, Andrew? Yeah, I think I have made that possible. Okay, let me find the right one. Okay, just got a couple of slides here. You all see that okay? Yes, looks okay, perfect. Great, great. So hi everyone, I'm Pamela Conrad. Thank you so much for um, inviting me to join today. I am a landscape architect and a principal at CMG Landscape Architecture in San Francisco. I've been practicing for about 20 years and primarily focused on large scale um, climate and resilience projects like Treasure Island or the San Francisco Waterfront Resilience Program. Um, but I'm also uh, the founder of Climate Positive Design. And once you get to know me, I'm really just a farm girl from Missouri at heart. Um, and I started getting into um, trying to understand carbon of everything outside the building about five years ago and realized there wasn't tools or resources or guidance um, for all of us that work outside the buildings to join the conversation that you're having um, sort of the outside the building improvements. Um, so since then, I've been rallying the 75,000 landscape architects of the world um, to join the conversation essentially uh, with our overall goal of making a a contribution to the overall drawdown needed um, through the built environment um, provided by providing tools, guidance, and um, resources. So um, the work that I've been leading started with um, case study analysis and starting to understand for the first time what the impacts are of the exterior built environment and um, quickly found that um, by for the first time having this information in front of us, being able to understand um, the embodied carbon, the operational carbon, the carbon sequestration, that we were able to cut our carbon emissions in half, double sequestration, um, really without changing the design significantly. Um, they're just greener projects in the end. So it was with um, that information that I launched uh, just about a year ago, the Climate Positive Design Challenge, and it sets targets for um, Years getting to getting to positive, so getting to a point where the project essentially has offset its own carbon footprint and is now um, actively part of the climate solution, taking um, more CO2 out of the atmosphere than it's emitting. And um, based on the work to date, um, I've found that if we start to apply those global practices to to all the projects around the world that we're contributing to over the next um, ten to thirty years, um, that we have an opportunity to take more out of the atmosphere than we're emitting. And by 2050, the potential to take upwards of a gigaton of CO2 out of the atmosphere. So the goal is to um, go beyond neutral and be climate positive. And to enable us to make this contribution um, through a fellowship through the Landscape Architecture Foundation um, that I received in 2018, I developed um, the Pathfinder app and <clears throat> essentially allows users very quickly to input um, the quantities of materials, um, plants, and operational maintenance things, site impacts, and um, they receive instant carbon feedback from the amount of CO2 that um, is coming from the body carbon, how much carbon is sequestering through the landscape, and then oper operational ongoing emissions, and it um, actively gives you your years to positive score and um, scorecards, feedback, things that can be plugged into LCAs and some of the other um, efforts that you all are working on. <clears throat> and a big part of this is, um, since we're kind of newbies to the conversation, is um, collecting this data and starting to share that and be very transparent about it. So we have now stats from the first year of um, the challenge and the launch. And so um, reached pretty good um, awareness in many countries around the world. Um, <clears throat> of close to 1500 projects logged um, from many companies and companies and contributors and starting to understand um, 
what those impacts are collectively um, over time of those projects. And so it's with this data that I'm hoping uh, might be useful to this group um, and to aggregate uh, all the impacts of what we're doing together and potentially share um, at things like the COP in Glasgow. So I'm really looking forward to potential collaboration with you all. And um, <clears throat> here's the link to the website and a whole bunch more links. Um, really, they're, they're all kind of just embedded in there, but, um, but you can find easily the, the details of the challenge and the stats, a uh, link to the app, methodology report, case studies, toolkit, news, and um, there's my contact information. So um, really look forward to collaborating with you all and um, making a difference together. So thanks, everyone. Pamela, that was awesome. I'm like, oh. wow, cool. And also, you know, I don't know if I'm telling the truth about this, but I think you may be the first landscape architect on one of these calls. So yay, we made it. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's just taken a couple of years. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really happy that you're on the call and I'm, I'm, I'm uh, I have great hopes that you'll be on the next one and the one after that. Um, and we'll explore ways to, I mean, you know, basically on this call, we've got in, interior structure, um, landscape architecture, and, um, and believe it or not, we've got um, Mick Patterson from Poisson Tectonics to tell us about um, skins and, um, and embodied carbon. Go for it. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Nice to be here. Nice to see you all. Very interesting, uh, very interesting uh, aggregation of uh, people and efforts, initiatives. I'm uh, really enjoying this. So, you know, the Facade Tectonics Institute is a um, uh, not nonprofit member organization um, with a mission, a mission driven uh, organization. Uh, the mission being primarily focused around research and education related to the building skin. Uh, we have organizational and uh, individual membership. Uh, it's basically, you know, a bunch of facade geeks that have a vision of the facade system uh, as the key to achieving these sustainability and resilience goals in, in, uh, in buildings and urban habitat, right? And, you know, we look at the influence of the building skin on the interior environment where, you know, pre-COVID days we were spending 90% of our time, uh, and I think it's been more since then. Um, the impact of the facade system on the exterior environment, uh, you know, especially in urban habitat, uh, the way that, uh, you know, that everything from, from exterior glare and the discomfort and harm that can be caused by that to the way it defines the character of uh, uh, of, of our uh, urban habitats, right? Um, and we, uh, you know, we, we recognize the uh, fragmentation that, that takes place in our industry. And so we're very aggressive about trying to bring together, uh, to bridge these fragments, right? And bring everybody together into the conversation and try and dial in the vocabulary so that when we talk about things like performance and sustainability and resilience, that we have the same thing in mind uh, so that we can really communicate. Um, and we are looking for the knowledge gaps between those silos, right? We're not looking to replicate any, anything that anybody else is doing. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's what we're up to. It's, uh, you know, we've got a number of committees, of course, a research and education committee to, uh, uh, to directly support the, the mission uh, and we also, in recognition of uh, the fact that, you know, so, so a key aspect of our mission is accelerating change uh, in the performance of the built environment, right? And, and we've recognized that, uh, you know, we've been burdened. I mean, we're, we're an international organization. We're North American centric to this point, although the, you know, the, the pandemic has, and the virtual events have, have tended to expand uh, you know, expand our reach. We have a lot of uh, European involvement now, um, but uh, uh, yeah, that's that's kind of what we're up to there. Fantastic! Thanks so much, Mick. Um, and I'm uh, 
I'm still getting connected. You know, Mick and I had a great conversation a few days ago, uh, our first introductory conversation. I've been, I've been uh, getting really into um, the work of the of facade tectonics, and along with that, I'm still trying to figure out the the terminology. <laughs> I've always I've always thought, of course, that tectonics had something to do with uh, global uh, planetary um, mood, m movement movement of plates, but uh, but then I looked it up in a dictionary and I discovered that tectonics is a it derives from a Latin term meaning to make or to build or to construct. So I'm I'm learning language as I go along here. Yeah, right. I mean, we you know we're fighting the uh, you know we're fighting the 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 hijacking of the term by you know the the seismic people, right? <laughs> We're, rec we're reclaiming it. Reclaiming the term. <laughs> yeah. Cool. All right, thanks, uh, thanks, Mick. Um, why don't we go on with uh, Aaron Smith from EEBA and tell us what, this is also kind of related to you know, who are the customers, um, but uh, tell us a little bit about EEBA and about your work there and how it connects with Embodied Carbon. Great, thanks, Andrew. And we just say EBA, but EBA, EBA is the- okay. Yep. EBA is the Energy and Environmental Building Alliance. Uh, I'm the CEO. I also lead Team Zero, which many of you are familiar with. So those two organizations have come together. We're a group of about 60,000 members, and we're dedicated toward driving market transformation for home builders and homeowners. Um, we're primarily North American, but again, with the... Um, the pivot to digital, we're expanding uh, our reach and, and getting members all over the globe, which I think is really exciting. But we really um, bring a place or kind of curate a place for the early adopters and innovators in home building to come together with their partners and learn and share and collaborate uh, toward a future that's zero energy, zero carbon, and zero health impacts. And I would say that um, we've done a good job on zero energy. A uh, lot of our builders are part of the zero energy ready home program through DOE or building net zero or, or doing lead or living building challenge. We want to open them up to all of the possibilities. Uh, you know, a new area for them is, is carbon. I, I think that we haven't thought critically about that for home builders. I think that the way that homes are constructed, it lends itself to uh, more, wood being used. But yeah, you know, I get nervous because a lot of people are changing over to, um, you know, vinyl plank flooring and, and, you know, there's different product selections that I think we can thoughtfully make. So I guess if I had one ask and it was really, you know, Chris, Chris Magwood and I from Endeavor are close. Um, I've asked him to come and speak to our membership and educate them more about carbon and how they can thoughtfully make decisions around uh, carbon. But yeah, that's a little bit uh, about our organization uh, really quickly, but we're just so happy to be here and, and learning from all of you, but we're residential focused just right. in the grand scheme of things. Great, thanks much. Um, and uh, Bruce King, you're online. Could you tell us a little bit about what's happening, um, kind of some amazing things happening in Marin County? Thanks, Andrew. Hi, everybody. Uh, actually, two things. Um, a lot of you know that we passed this low carbon concrete building code amendment in Marin County a year ago. Too soon to say the effect because COVID started right after that. But um, I, I'm I'm now working with uh, NBI, New Buildings Institute. I think Kevin's on the line here, maybe another, but um, to take it national in a sense, to, uh, to build it into the ASHRAE 189.1 code, which is the basis of our green codes. And ultimately we hope get it into the international building code. Um, a daunting project and I'm going to be reaching out to all the structural engineers and everybody on CLF to get as much data as we can get for basis to do that in a non-stupid way. Um, uh, and as a second note, a lot of you know Chris Magwood and I are writing a book, a sort of a follow-up to the new carbon architecture and um, needless to say quite a lot going on with that, trying to keep track of this freaking world as this call illustrates, there's so much going on. 
But we're trying now to answer the question, how much carbon can we sequester in the built environment? Still, even here, we're talking about how much less harm can we do? How close can we get to zero? That's all good, but we have to go past zero. That's why we titled the book, Build Beyond Zero. How much carbon can we actually absorb into the built environment? And it has to be in the multiple gigatons or, or we're not relevant. And it, I, it looks to be very much so, but I say this to you because if anybody has any particular insight or a reference document, uh, I have plenty, but I may not have them all. And if you have one, I'd be very pleased to get any input or, or thoughts from you about that. Thank you. Great, thank you, uh, Bruce. And now we've got uh, Reshma Singh is here from the Impel program of the US, US Department of Energy. Uh, Reshma, uh, would you tell us a little bit about Impel? And then um, I think you've got a deadline coming up in a couple of days here. Yes. Um... Let me turn my video on. Good morning, everybody. It's lovely to be here. And thanks, um, Andrew, for convening this a really impressive group of people. I've, uh, and I have to say, um, Pamela, I'm the second landscape architect. On this oh, group, wow. So. <laughs> well, one call. Fantastic. Yes. So, but uh, I'm sort of wearing a different hat right now. And if I can have about five minutes, if I can present a slide deck, I would really appreciate that. Um, yes, I've given you the permission to share your screen. Could you keep it down to maybe two and a half to three minutes, though? We've got several sure. other people to talk. Of course, absolutely. Great, so, thank you. Great, thanks, Andrew. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the IMPEL program, which is a program which is uh, hosted by Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, which is a national lab at the foothills of Berkeley. And uh, we are um, basically a national lab funded by the Department of Energy. And Impel is a tech to market program, which I'm bringing here to this group of nonprofits here because I think it might be of value here. So just in a nutshell, we are one of 17 national labs. Um, we have a 1 billion annual budget for research. Our claim to fame is 14 Nobel prizes, many R&D awards, and several uh, companies accelerated by lab technologies and capabilities. We do have a very strong building technologies uh, and urban systems group. And as you can see, it was founded by Art Rosenfeld back in the 1970s. And a lot of milestones along the way, which includes work with electronic ballasts, uh, DO2 energy simulation, energy plus, our flex lab, which is sitting on a rotating turntable so that we can do uh, amazing buildings testing for uh, systems. And we have several patterns, etc. So um, we do have three sort of market facing programs. One is the Flex Lab, which I just mentioned here is a building which rotates and you have thermal testing, windows, envelope, embodied, operational carbon, all sorts of testing can happen here. Second is Cyclotron Road, which is a fellowship program uh, for entrepreneurial scientists. And then finally, Impel, which is a pitch training program. So Impel is basically incubating market propelled entrepreneurship mindset at labs and beyond. And it provides three things. One is um, world-class coaching for helping building innovators pitch their ideas for market access. Second is obviously gain an innovator network. And third is access to tech to market programs, both on the government side, as well as up with our partners, Green Town Labs and Austin Tech Incubator. So the reason I'm kind of sharing this with you today is so that we can maybe take this to your networks uh, on how you can move your buildings and energy technology to market. And these could be hardware, software products, services, systems, solutions, and even programs and policies. You've had several programs and policies come through, like the Build America program, the Workforce Development Program, et cetera. And innovators could be entrepreneurs, could be national lab staff, it could be students, and could also be staff from nonprofits and governments with new ideas around buildings. So you could pitch for um, funding for a co-founder, for access to test labs, for access to manufacturing facilities. It's really to help you move the needle across these different values of debt. And the way we provide access is not just through coaching, but because we provide access to grants, validation and manufacturing through our DOE, NSF, um, Advanced Manufacturing Office channels, as well as through our two partners, Greentown Labs and Austin Tech Incubator. So here's an example of um, some of our innovators who were selected after the Impel coaching to pitch at this National Energy Efficiency Shark Tank last year in December, which had folks from Better Buildings Initiative, 
the National Association of State Energy Offices, uh, the WIP program, uh, of course, the Building Technologies Office at DOE, which is our sponsor. And then we have access to a um, couple of partner networks. So we route some of the innovators that go through our program into um, an accelerator called SEAL and also two pitch events, which are being sponsored by these two organizations. So basically why um, you know, I'm here is to encourage, uh, first of all, to let you know about this program and then encourage folks who want to grow their brand grow your access to market for your programs, for your policies, to be able to push to a multitude of stakeholders who don't exactly understand what's happening in the buildings business. Our two uh, coaches, from, one is from Stanford, he's a, a co-president of Stanford Angels and Entrepreneurs, and our second faculty member is from Haas Business School. They both have extensive experience. And of course, because we're at a national lab, have the owners to move buildings, technologies to market and programs to market, we'd love to help you kind of get that access to the government as well as to the private sector. So we have a deadline coming up on February 15th for a final workshop of the season, which is gonna happen on March 12th. So please apply, I'll send, a, I'll pop a note here. It's impel.lbl.gov. And thank you for your time and attention. Great, thank you so much, Reshma. It's, uh, it's great to see you this morning. Um, Vincent uh, Martinez from Architecture 2030, would you give us a, a, a brief update on what you all are up to these days? Good morning here in the States and good afternoon, those in Europe. Um, sure, thanks Andrew for asking me to give a few updates. One thing is in collaboration with Carbon Leadership Forum, Washington Environmental Council, EcoTrust and World Wildlife Fund. Um, we are hosting in mid-April a leadership summit for climate, wood and forests sponsored by Google to focus on the connection between the uptake in mass timber and other wood construction in North America and a linkage into climate smart forestry practices as a carbon solution. So that's been ongoing and there's four working groups, uh, including a Carbon Leadership Forum leading the development of a online hub uh, of resources. So that's exciting. Um, and we're focusing on in, enabling collective action, which I'm co-chairing with Jason Grant from WWF, as well as looking at procurement uh, um, opportunities. My colleague, Lindsay Rasmussen is chairing that uh, working group. We're also looking at carbon markets, um, as well as, I'm gonna miss the four, fourth one, uh, life cycle assessment uh, and measuring progress, which Stephanie Carlisle from CLF is leading. So that work is undergoing with a variety of stakeholders from all levels of industry. I have a sort of a cheat list here, uh, including owners, developers, architects, engineers, contractors, environmental NGOs, industry and forestry landowners and managers and consultants and academics. So it's quite a broad list of folks that are involved in that effort leading up until April. Um, the other announcement that I have is in partnership with the Royal Institute of British Architects and Architects Declare, Architecture 2030 is co-hosting a built environment summit pre-conference uh, of parties 26 in London. Um, it will be hosted on October 27th through 29th at Reba's headquarters in central London, uh, 66 Portland Place, a really beautiful venue. Um, the objectives of the summit is to have a pre-COP uh, summit with the built environment leaders to demonstrate significant progress towards meeting the 1.5 climate goals. Um, uh, from planning, building, construction, manufacturing, professional and industry sectors, as well as subnational governments. And it's really to send strong market signals to give governments confidence to ramp up their NDCs and short-term targets in alignment with the 1.5 targets. So um, we will, are finalizing our press release and same the date website. Some of you have seen some of that um, on back channels that should go out next week. And then we'll be reaching out to many of you and please reach out to us. We're looking for partners in the development of that summit that will be pre-COP. I should note that um, World Green Building Council, as well as a host of other NGO partners, will be hosting a built environment and cities uh, day at the COP in the blue zone during the week of COP. So that's an exciting opportunity. We've already been in preliminary discussions with both World GBC as well as Global Alliance for Building and Construction about um, collaborating on the two events. Um, we're hoping to develop a form of a declaration coming out of our event that can be taken into the COP during the Build Environment and Cities Day and World, um, the Global Alliance for Building and Construction is supportive of that process and will be one of our convening partners, as well as the American Institute of Architects and their, this 
related organization, which has too long of an acronym for me to get right, uh, from Italy, who is also a co-host of the COP. And we're engaging with the Scots Architect uh, Organization as well. So it should be a really great global event. If it doesn't happen in person, it will, either way, it will be webcast and streamed out online. So right. please look for some updates from us in the next week, and we look forward to working with all of you. Great. Thanks very much, Vincent. Uh, we've got three more updates, and then we'll have a presentation on policy by um, by Megan Lewis. Um, and that's a, a nice uh, what you had to share with us, Vincent. It's a it's a great transition to uh, Ju um, Yun Ha from the Global Alliance for Building and Construction. Would you tell us a little bit about um, about um, um, preparation for COP and, and what uh, you all are engaged in right now from the United Nations. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I'll give a quick uh, intro about uh, the Global ABC for those of you who don't know. Um, so UNEP is the host for the Secretariat for the Global Alliance for Building and Construction, uh, Global ABC as we like to call it. And um, our initiative was founded in 2015 during COP15. So COP is really at the heart of uh, all of our actions. And uh, within the Global ABC, we work to mobilize the sectors, um, key stakeholders uh, within the building and construction sector, and also to increase commitments from governments and companies uh, towards a zero emission, efficient, and resilient buildings and construction sector, as we like to say it. <laughs> uh, uh, concretely, that means um, uh, the Global ABC uh, strives to be a global advocate uh, for the importance of the sector uh, for global climate action. Also providing a mutual and trusted platform to set uh, targets for decarbonization, track progress, track action, and share knowledges and good practices. And finally, providing the key measures for countries to adopt, helping them set priorities in their own strategies and um, basically based on their uh, local context. And that's done through our uh, various uh, flagship products. So uh, at the Global APC is really about convening all the stakeholders along the, the entire value chain of this extremely fragmented sector uh, to spur the radical collaboration that we need to see um, for real systemic uh, transformation. Uh, and in terms of COP, I mean, uh, we have uh, a lot of activities planned. Uh, we are not really sure about uh, which form uh, COP will be, probably will be a, a hybrid between, um, you know, in-person and, and um, virtual. Uh, but for now, our plans include having um, a really, really big presence for buildings during COP. Um, and that could be done, that would be through um, the NPGCA process or so the Marrakesh Partnership for Global Climate Action, which is, um, the uh, initiative that convenes all the non-party stakeholders during COP. And that would be through the Race to Zero uh, campaign, but also through the pathways and potentially a Buildings Day uh, that could be hosted uh, under that, the, the Marrakesh partnership process. Uh, as Vincent mentioned already, uh, possibly a Buildings and Cities Day um, that would be uh, under the official calendar of COP26. And uh, that's something that's being done with World GBC and uh, many other organizations that are working in the space. And finally, through a real estate and buildings pavilion that is being convened by uh, Global ABC and which I'm happy to share more information about um, in the chat. Um, so yeah, lots of exciting activities uh, expected for buildings during COP26. So. Well, let's hope we can have an in-person one. But that's it on my side. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much, Hugh. And um, by the way, I, I just want to double down on your use of the phrase radical collaboration. I, I love the sound of that. And that's, I think, what this uh, what this call represents the beginning of. Um, and then we've got uh, Truda. Uh, Truda from uh, Truda Rock, uh, Rockin from um, the Carbonet um, Sorry, help me out here. I'm having a really hard time focusing on how words fit together this morning. So Truda, <laughs> would you please yes. introduce yourself? Thank you, Andrew. Uh, yeah, I'm Truda Raukin from the Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance, but- uh, I knew that, by the way, I knew that. I just want to <laughs> let everybody know, I knew what those letters stood for. Right, uh, we tend to almost forget ourselves sometimes because we usually go by CNCA. 
but let me share my screen and uh, and so that you have something to look at while I'm talking. Okay, there we go. Um, right. Uh, some of you are maybe not familiar with CNSA, so just a few uh, words on that. So we are a global network of leading cities that are working together to reach carbon neutrality well before 2050. Um, our mission pretty much sums it up, which is to mobilize transformative climate action in cities to achieve prosperity, equity, resilience, and better quality of life for all on a thriving planet. Now, how we work to achieve that is that we see that the best way that cities can um, uh, can lock in long-term transformative change is through policy development, adoption, and uh, implementation. And one of the areas where we are working with our members is on uh, embodied carbon and bio-based materials in Europe, which is what I'm going to be talking about now. On January 12th, we launched the Dramatically Reducing Embodied Carbon Project in Europe. Um, it has been, it's a 2 uh, million euro grant from the Laudus Foundation that enables us to do this work with cities. Um, it builds on a policy framework that Cecile uh, talked about a little earlier. And for those of you who are not familiar with it, um, the policy framework describes in detail uh, 50 plus policies that cities can develop, adopt and implement to reduce embodied carbon. And that was developed and launched last year in a partnership with Architecture 2030 and BioNova. So as I said, the, the project builds on a framework, but because it's not like that, just because you have a framework, cities can it just, it just translates into the policy work that actually needs to happen. So in this new, much larger project, we foster, um, the rapid and widespread adoption of policies that lead to both reduced embodied carbon and also increase the use of bio-based materials across city and national governments in Europe. Uh, it is a three-year project and, um, and uh, CNCA's uh, Vanguard cities are already uh, involved in the project. You see the list of them here. Um, they are all working already on their policies, but will also re receive technical support in this, in this project. So Amsterdam, Copenhagen, Glasgow, Hamburg, Helsinki, London, Oslo, and Stockholm. Uh, but in addition to that, we will recruit another 10 to 15 cities that are ready, that are sort of poised for this type of policy work. And the project has uh, four main activities. So as I said, identify and recruit cities that poised for policy adoption. But the main part of the work is going to be on activity two, which is to, um, to foster the adoption of ambitious embodied carbon and bio-based material policies in 10 to 20 cities. So to do that, uh, the project provides technical uh, uh, support, communications, and also then a lot of dialogue with industry because uh, its um, policy needs to be informed by industry and, uh, and also be timed in the, in the appropriate uh, way so that it actually follows a, a natural progress. And then we also know that the cities alone cannot achieve um, uh, dramatically reduce embodied carbon or increased use of biomass materials. They are definitely dependent on the national level. So building a national uh, building coalitions uh, to to collectively try to influence the national level to um, uh, to both develop and and adopt uh, policies that reduce embodied carbon and also increased use of biomass materials will be. A, the third activity and the fourth activity being in Europe, the EU sets a lot of the parameters for city action on this on this topic. And so um, building a coalition of both national and local level and industry is going and also other organizations, um, in particular based in Brussels, 
will be uh, the fourth activity of this work. And, but we're not doing this all alone as CNCA. We are working with uh, three lead technical partners. Um, BioNova is uh, our lead technical partner on, on providing the technical assistance to, to cities. Cities will also be able then to work with local technical partners that they see as useful to uh, both help the cities, but also to help with the, the national and EU dialogues on, uh, on policy development. We have partnered with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, and then also being in Europe uh, and working towards the EU level, it's um, and EuroCities is a third very natural partner to, to include in this work. And as I said, we just launched on January 12th. So I don't have a lot of exciting updates about the policy work happening in cities, but if we are invited to share again, then I, uh, I'm sure we will have some more updates for you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Truda. Uh, that was great to hear about, and I'm looking forward to the next update, which will um, provide uh, more of the story of what's actually happening on the ground in those cities. And then finally, we've got um, the NAACP's uh, project, um, amazing network, by the way, um, called Centering Equity in the Sustainable Building Sector. We've got three friends from, the, from CESBS. Um, so let me first introduce Mandy Lee, and then she can introduce the others on the call and tell us a little bit of I'd love to, to, um, to share this invitation for folks to join, um, join this uh, initiative as well uh, from all of the organizations on the call here and your local networks as well. This is just an incredibly important project. So Mandy Lee, take it away. Hi everyone, thanks so much, Andrew. Um, I'm gonna be really brief and then pass it off to two of our members and leaders who will share even more about themselves and their work. But I'll just say that um, the Centering Equity in the Sustainable Building Sector Initiative, for those who are not yet familiar, is the NAACP's um, budding coalition of more than 500 people, including our members across the country and building and sustainability professionals, working together to ensure a just transition in, in the green building industry uh, that is by, for, and led by black and brown communities and low wealth communities, those who have not typically been in spaces like this. Um, and, and I have put our website in the chat, so feel free to check that out. It has a ton of great content, um, but I'm actually gonna turn it over to two of our members to say hello and share a little bit about their work as well. Um, so Marnice Jackson is on the line. We also have Randall Torre. Uh, and Kamathi Booth may, may be here, but uh, if you are here on the phone, just let us know. But I'll start off with Marnice. Thanks so much, Mandy. And hello, everyone. And thank you so much for this opportunity. So um, like Mandy said, I am a member of the Northern Oakland County branch, which is in Pontiac, Michigan, um, where we're focusing on our energy efficiency um, campaign. And uh, that also includes um, climate and energy democracy on the local level. Uh, which also eventually includes some building decarbonization work within the communities of uh, demonstration projects. Um, however, in my position, I work for the Midwest Building Decarbonization Coalition, uh, which is a coalition across eight states, um, Iowa, Indiana, Michigan, Illinois, Minnesota, uh, Missouri, Ohio, Wisconsin, and I believe, I think I, think I said Minnesota. Um, and so, um, the mission is to inspire and educate Midwesterners to end new installations of fossil fuel, fuel equipment in residential and commercial buildings by 2030. And so of course achieve zero emissions um, from these buildings by 2050. And so with this um, cross cutting uh, initiative, we work to convene people. We um, do a lot of strategic planning. Um, we have market transformation collaboratives. Um, we focus on equity fundraising, where I center groups like the NAACP um, chapters, um, excuse me, cha um, branches to actually do demonstration projects um, through our re-granting process. Um, and then we also provide technical assistance and regional and policy assistance. 
And so, of course, it's an invitation to join the um, coalition, but also I am a newly appointed member of the state of Michigan, um, Governor Whitmer's um, Climate Council on Solutions. So um, if you're a Michigander, um, please, um, I will put my contact information in the chat. But if you'd like to engage in what we're planning to do on the state level, please let me know. And I will pass it over to Randall. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you doing? Welcome. Uh, Hi, I'm sorry. I'm going to try to put my camera up, but I have like a big glare in the background, so I apologize for that. Um, how's everyone doing? Um, so my name is Randall Teray. I am a member of um, the NYCHA branch of the NAACP, as well as a um, staff member with an organization called Riseboro Community Partnerships. I don't know if many of you are familiar with Riseboro. I put a article from the New York Times that we recently um, had discussing our um, use of Passive House in our developments. We have been working with Passive House since um, 2014 on our first project called the Mennonite Project in Brooklyn. It was a 24 unit building, um, um, a new construction. And uh, from there, every building we've done since then has been Passive House. Um, we recently took on a project of 160 units, 100, 148 units, uh, build a uh, series of buildings in Bushwick, Brooklyn, um, which we call Casa Pasiva um, and uh, Passive House in Spanish. <laughs> and uh, that project is basically we're taking very, very, very old tenement buildings and converting them to Passive House. Um, as you, many of you know, that process is a uh, daunting process but it, we find that if we can get to the point where we could um, convert those buildings, those leaky um, buildings and convert them to a pass house building, we would be saving energy, uh, uh, having incredible energy um, um, carbon emissions situations. Um, so I think that this is the sort of work that we're trying to do. We're trying to bring it so that we can show the success of converting these old tenements um, aging buildings. One of the buildings is as old as 1901. Um, so you can imagine <laughs> how that building compares to uh, many buildings and we look at new construction. So we feel that that's the, sort of the way to go. And then our next goal for, for the NYCHA branch of the NAACP is to start to have the city look at converting many of our housing developments, which you know, there are 434,000 people living in public housing and their stories have been numerous about the number of maintenance issues and, and heating issues and things like that. If we can convert, convince the city and the federal government to start convince, converting um, public housing to um, you know, more carbon friendly um, um, uh, buildings and converting them as they are. So not to necessarily tear down new older buildings, but to convert newer, um, Old, not to tear down all the buildings to make newer buildings, but to convert all the buildings into more um, energy friendly buildings, that will be the way to go. So I've been proud to sort of, I'm just a recent member of uh, the NAACP's um, uh, group with uh, Mandy, but I am proud to be part of this. And I hope to, if you know, if you have any questions from me, you know, please feel free to reach out uh, and I'll pass it back to Mandy. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Randall. And that's great. So I, I just wanna, um, this has kind of been an amazing call so far and we're not even done yet. Um, the, uh, the, um, the capper on this morning is Megan Lewis, who's gonna be talking about um, policy status or kind of policy developments related to embodied carbon. Um, she's a, she was a contributing editor to the practice guide for life cycle assessment of buildings. Um, and as a CLF staff member now, she's responsible for leading our policy research to support blockchain initiatives and a host of other uh, types of policies. So, um, Megan, you want to take it over then? Sure. Uh, go with this. How's that? That's good. Can you go okay. full screen? Uh, yeah. that better? That's good. Okay, great. Um, so as 
Andrew mentioned, I joined the CLF uh, last fall to lead our policy research. This is an area that um, we're definitely working on a lot more at the CLF and partially because of the huge number of policies but that I'll talk about in a minute um, that are popping up and providing support for government agencies and policymakers who are trying to navigate this, the really technical waters um, of some of these policies. And then also continuing to build capacity in the places where they're being implemented so they can be implemented uh, effectively. And, oh, there we go. Um, so before talking about some of what we're seeing, I just wanted to start with saying that there's um, a huge range of policies that we need in order to, to drive embodied carbon reductions. There's ones like exactly what Randall was just talking about, really focusing on reuse and extending the life of buildings. Um, there's some really interesting work happening in cities on uh, uh, deconstruction, workforce development, um, extending historic uh, reuse tax credits, just like a huge range of policies relating to land use and other incentives that have to do with extending the life of buildings. Um, and so we see that as sort of in, in this first stage before you're even building a building. And then when you move into design and you're thinking more about what materials to select for the project, um, what uh, the you know, what systems, how the building is shaped, all of that. Um, there's lots of tools. So existing whole building LCA tools, new ones that are being developed by people like what Chris shared earlier. And we see those tending to show up more in the sort of zoning code. The code is a newer uh, heading that direction. Um, green building certifications have had whole building LCA for a while now, um, where you're really, it's impacting the design of the building and it's more processes led by architects, engineers. And then the last kind that we're seeing probably the most in the US is um, of procurement policies. And so um, this is, you know, materials have already been selected and it's really about choosing the best possible material within um, the, the materials that you're using. So for example, in the second one, you, maybe you're deciding concrete versus steel. This is just what is the best possible concrete. You've already decided you're gonna use concrete. How can it be the best that it can be for its function? Um, and for these policies are primarily, there's been a lot of alignment actually. They're really all using EPDs as a tool. Um, then some of them are building off of uh, tools like EC3 in order to collect that data for implementation, or, or sorry, just to make it easier to track for implementation. Um, and there's a couple other variations besides by clean that I'll talk about in a sec. Um, so this is a lot, which gives you an idea of how much is going on. I'm gonna to try to be really fast um, given the time, but essentially um, in North America, there is federal, there's action on every level. So at the federal level, um, there was a proposed uh, federal buy clean program in the Clean Futures Act in, in 2019, or sorry, in March, 2020. Um, and that is continuing to be developed and may come, uh, may be announced as a, an executive order or uh, go through the uh, House and Senate, but and basically it's a, a full bike clean program um, route similar to an expanded version of what um, was developed in California and the United States. Um, recently, the General Services Administration of the government so built all of the uh, US federal buildings uh, accepted recommendations for how they could start incorporate embodied carbon policy. There's a, the Canadian government has an initiative um, called LCA squared, which I won't do justice, but it's a expansive, um, like five year trajectory program developing data sets um, and tools, all moving towards um, a comprehensive embodied carbon policy for all of Canada. Um, there's also a lot of clean manufacturing incentives and research and sort of innovative materials research we're seeing at the federal level this year all increased a lot over the past couple of months, as you can imagine, uh, in the US. Um, and then on the state level, there are currently uh, five or yeah, five bills right now that are um, being looked at in so Washington, Oregon and Minnesota all have bike clean bills um, and New York and New Jersey have low carbon concrete bills. So um, for those of you who don't know what a bike clean bill is, it just basically means that anything that the state is buying, so transportation or depending on the bill, maybe it's transportation and buildings, um, anything that they're buying needs to provide uh, data about the environmental data. In Washington, it also requires um, providing labor data for the manufacturing processes to the state. 
Um, and then what is seen in California is that that bill, um, there's now limits for those materials. So California's was steel insulation and glass. Uh, Washington's bill, for example, is steel, concrete, and wood. So um, depending on what state, they're all a little bit different, but um, moving towards this trajectory of, you know, uh, manufacturers providing data and then there being limits on the maximum amount of carbon that can be in any product. Um, and then the low carbon concrete bills are a little bit different, but they still require disclosure of EPDs, but instead of setting limits, they're using um, competition in the bid process to incentivize lower carbon. Um, we're seeing growing interest in introducing embodied carbon into codes. Um, so ASHRAE 189.1 and 90.2 um, have, are looking at incorporating body carbon. Uh, and then there's also been a lot of conversations at the state level for energy and building codes. Um, and some of that is related to the sort of Marin County model and um, other conversations are pretty expansive and thinking more about whole building, like more performance-based pathways for buildings or for a broader suite of materials. Uh, and then last on the city level, um, some really, it's been really exciting. So the CNCA policy framework has really inspired a lot of cities actually. And I've had, um, I've had conversations with cities in the US that have specifically said that they're like, they saw it and have read through and they're thinking about what they can implement, which is always great. You know, when you create a resource to actually see it being used like that. Um, and then there's, uh, as I mentioned, um, there's green building programs, reuse and deconstruction policies, climate action plans. Um, and then some exciting work coming out of transportation agencies as well at the state and local level. So that was a lot. If you would like to know any about any more of these, um, I wanted to highlight, so as Andrew mentioned, so I'm highlighting the C41 in particular because we do not have good coverage right now of global and, this, and also because it's an amazing tool. Um, and so we're tracking like as close as we can, all the, what's going on in the US at the city and state level um, in our policy toolkit, and which I'll talk more about in a second, but, um, but basically we have an interactive map where we're just updating the status of these policies. Um, so uh, along with some other resources and then actually, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll share. I think it's easier to just really quickly, I'll switch to share what the policy toolkit looks like, but essentially um, this is just, oh, sorry, is, there we go. Um, sorry about that, thought I had it already pulled up. Um, so on my tiny screen, it's hard to see very many things at once, but um, we launched this toolkit just like a month or two ago and um, we'll continue to add to it over time but there's three main parts so there's an, a, um, a series of primers which right now focus more on procurement policies on buy clean um, we'll continue to expand to up to resources on those other policies I mentioned um, so on like embodied carbon 101, what is buy clean, guidance on embodied carbon disclosure and EPDs. So not just related to buy clean. Um, and then there's our fun fancy map that Andrew helped with. We're very, very excited about um, and links to all the policies that are mentioned. Uh, and then also really relevant for this group as well is um, we're trying to continue to um, organize other resources to make them sort of a one-stop shop for body carbon policy resources. So if uh, I have missed yours in this first tranche, which I'm sure I have, because there's a lot, please uh, let me know and I'll make sure we get it added. And that, I was just gonna end on just a couple of like thoughts or things that I'm gonna be looking for uh, in 2021, um, things that we're thinking about a lot at CLF and, and many were touched on today, which is great. So one is just that capacity building and awareness is still really important. So I think sometimes it's easy to feel like because there's so much policy stuff going on and it's like increasing and I'm like amazed that like a year ago I could have talked to someone that had no idea what I was talking about and now they're like people referencing it in like town meetings and that's pretty crazy. But that doesn't mean that it's um, that people actually <laughs> like have had the chance to be trained on it and um, uh, as to the level needed. 
also just the increased federal awareness and attention is already shifting things pretty quickly. And so if there is an executive order passed in the US, like things will change pretty quickly here, um, which will be exciting, but don't even know what direction that will take things. Um, also, I just want to emphasize that this we've had some conversations this year that I hope to really expand is how can policies be better addressing equity as well as embodied carbon. So the um, it definitely reduces impacts on frontline communities when, you know, when there's cleaner manufacturing that that tends to be right now the burden is entirely pretty much on low income communities or communities of color. And so how can we shift that. Um, well, so I guess, first of all, it's you know, reducing that burden, but instead of just reducing, can we shift policies to go farther and make sure that it's actually um, trying to move towards a just transition? However, so um, that's something we've started to see a little bit in conversation and policy, but I think that there's still a lot of work to do about how can we actually uh, better address that? And so that's something that um, I'm excited to see develop more this year. And and then uh, the other things, um, we'll be also looking a little bit more at corporate policy as well this year at CLF. So trying to develop a similar toolkit um, to the policymaker focused tools, um, which one of the main differences is just thinking a lot more about scope three emissions and carbon accounting and putting a finer point on the business case. So it's great to hear about some of your work, Marta, earlier. And uh, last on the never ending journey of improving standards, tools, and data, because I think for a lot of people, um, the policies are a little bit scary because we've been, you know, we as a world have been saying for a while that like, well, once there's a policy, then like magically all this data, will, people will finally like all will all band together and then make it perfect. But it's like, well, things are changing. So that better happen soon or, it's, or things won't be ready. So anyway, a lot of exciting things happening this year. Um, with that, I'm going to pass it back to you, Andrew. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Megan. Really appreciate all of your incredibly hard work. And, uh, and uh, so we're at the end of our 90 minutes, and it has been an intense and packed 90 minutes. So thank you all for, um, for your patience and engagement, and for and for your participation. Uh, we've uh, we've got a lot of links and a lot of resources to look at, and I'll be posting all of the. The, the chat itself, along with the key links that everybody provided in the chat window um, to our online forum, the Carbon Leadership Forum community. Most of you I know are already members of that online community, but I'll be, I'll make certain that everybody who is not is going to get a personal invitation from me to please join it and instructions on how to do that. And then uh, hopefully we'll be using that online forum in a more aggressive, ambitious, and successful way to share information, links, resources, uh, timetables, all kinds of things. So thank you all for being here today. It's been great. And now, um, I guess that's it. So thanks a lot. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks all. Thank you. Bye. 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 Andrew, just want to say I got your voicemail and we'll set up a time to talk. Cool. All right. Sorry if I screwed that up. I'm not sure what. No, I no. I think we re-eliminated those calls and and we just never got them all okay. off our calendars. So we'll right. start. We'll start it again. I would like to continue. So. All right. Sounds all good. Right. Take care. Bye then. Take care.